The Thing in the Well by Nancy Roberts One of the many legends that surround old Fort Niagara is an old and grisly story about this building, the French Castle. The moon is full above the castle on a summer night, that is when they say it happens, and for all we know it may be happening tonight. Pray it won't, or pray at least that neither you nor I will be there to see it if it should. <laughs> but wait. In my horror, I am getting ahead of myself. Old Fort Niagara at Youngstown, New York, is one of the northernmost historic sites in the United States. The impressive French castle, as it is called, was erected in 1726. These fortifications, which guarded the vital water routes to the west and were occupied at various times by French voyagers, British grenadiers, and American soldiers, have been well preserved. Today the castle is just as it stood before the Revolution with its massive stone walls and bastions, blockhouses and stockade, moat and drawbridge. In the summer months, the roar of muskets and roll of drums reverberate beside Lake Ontario as colorful pageantry celebrates the history of the old fortifications. Most military forts have seen good and evil days, just as the body of a murdered man sometimes rises to the surface of the water to expose his murderer. Dark deeds that once took place here persist among the legends surrounding old Fort Niagara. One grisly event continues to be told. Our story begins in the days just before the Indian War when two French soldiers whom we shall call Henry Leclerc and Jean-Claude de Rochefort were stationed here. The fort in which they lived was a little city in itself, the largest place south of Montreal or west of Albany. Everything that the soldiers needed for daily life was there. They had a mess hall, barracks, bakery, blacksmith shop, and, for worship, a small chapel with a large ancient dial over the door to mark the hourly course of the sun. The well in the center of the castle was there in the event the fort was ever surrounded and besieged. After the British captured and occupied it in 1759, they feared the French might have poisoned the water, so they filled the well with dirt and covered the top with large, flat stones that matched the rest of the floor. It was not until the 1920s that the well was restored. In those early years, a burial ground lay just outside the massive gates, and over its entrance was painted in large characters the word, Rest just how some of the poor wretches were sent to their rest in this barren field is open to speculation. Undoubtedly, there were those who came straight from the dungeon to the burial ground, for this fort also served as a harsh prison. The dungeon, called the Black Hole, was a dark and dismal place. Over in one corner was a barbarous apparatus used for strangling those who offended the despotic rulers of a time when both justice and mercy were in short supply. On the dungeon's walls, from top to bottom, prisoners had laboriously carved their names, a few pitiful words, or a family emblem. Imagine the distress of one merchant at the fort who decided to hide some valuables in the dungeon when an attack was expected by superior British forces. He went there lay one night, and on the wall, from among hundreds of French names, one leapt out at him. It was his own family name, D'Artagnan, carved in large letters. Once the bones of a woman were found when it became necessary to clear out an old mess hall sink, confirming people's suspicions that the fort was often the scene of foul murder. Thus amid the natural beauty of the land and the lake, it is clear 
that the most atrocious crimes also took place in Old Fort Niagara. But let us return to our story. During any occupation, there is a need for celebrations to break the monotony, and the French often held parties on the third floor of the castle. It was the custom of the officers to invite a number of Indian girls from the nearby Seneca village. Among the Senecas, women had considerable power and were respected. They both nominated members of the tribal council and removed them if they misbehaved. Henry Leclerc, a young man of a good family from Bordeaux, France, had left early one evening of the party with several fellow officers to escort the women to the castle. Henry had personal reasons for going, as his heart had been captured by a lovely Indian girl named Oneida. They had no sooner arrived at the Seneca village, however, that a cloudburst occurred and no one wanted to leave until it was over. On the return to the castle, the sky was clear and the night was beautiful, complete with an enormous full moon. Henry and Oneida lingered a little behind the others, admiring the moon and happy in each other's company. By the time the girls and their escorts reached the castle, the wine was flowing freely, for Henry could hear loud talk and outbursts of laughter as they mounted the stairs to the third floor. The party is already quite noisy, remarked Oneida. Henry agreed. If some of the men begin to get out of hand, I'll take you back to the village early, he said. When the girls entered the room, cheers rang out. For a time there was singing and dancing, and all went well. Unfortunately, an officer named Jean-Claude de Rochefort, whom Henry particularly despised, had pulled up a chair and seated himself on the other side of Oneida. Jean-Claude was a former seaman, and if he had not once been a pirate, Henry was certain he was at least a scoundrel. Jean-Claude also fancied himself irresistible to the ladies. All efforts that Henry and Oneida made at conversation were futile, for Jean-Claude constantly interrupted. With more wine, his behavior worsened. Several times Oneida took de Rochefort's hand from her arm, but he continued to become even bolder. Mon petit chéri, how do you resist me, he said placing his arm around her shoulders and attempting to pull her close. "'Because you are a pig,' the angry young woman shot back at him. "'Why, you little!' shouted Jean-Claude, seizing her roughly and thrusting his face close to hers. Henry jumped from his chair and struck Jean-Claude's face with such a blow that it, he released the girl in surprise. There was the thud of fists striking flesh and bone. Jean-Claude was getting much the worst of it. He leapt behind a chair and, to the other officer's surprise, drew his sword. Henry had to retreat enough to draw his own weapon. Henry thrust repeatedly at his attacker, and the greater amount of wine that Jean-Claude had consumed was now giving Henry the advantage. The blade of Henry's sword nicked de Rochefort's arm, then his cheek. Other officers had first tried to stop them, but then assumed that the duel would end when one or the other was wounded. Jean-Claude was always volatile, but tonight his temper combined with alcohol and the insult to his pride had sent him into a frenzy. Henry had the skill and ability to outlast his foe, however, and the other officers knew it. He withstood the mighty slashing blows that deflected his skillful thrusts and avoided return lunges by stepping from one side to the other to tire his enemy. Henry moved to keep from backing into one of the Indian girls, and then he realized his danger. He was directly in front of the stairway. Seizing his advantage, Jean-Claude lunged forward with a quick thrust to the body, and involuntarily Henry stepped back to the brink of the top of the stairs. Now Henry's peril was great, and Jean-Claude became even more reckless. He took a cut across the chin, but charged forward with his body like a bull, as if to grab Henry about the waist and hurl him down the stairs. And to avoid grappling with him, Henry moved backward down the stairs. His only hope was to keep Jean-Claude at a safe distance with the rapier-sharp point of his sword, and 
try for a mortal thrust to his fellow's heart or abdomen. To this end, he slowly retreated down the stairs, waiting for the right moment to deliver the blow. As it seemed that the duel would be a long one, the other officers stayed on the third floor with the Indian girls. The duelists continued down the flight of steps until they were a short distance from the first floor. Henry then began to formulate a more charitable plan. Being the more agile man, when both reached the first floor, he would whirl around, mount a few steps, and leap upon Jean-Claude, pinning him to the floor. If he could execute the move quickly enough, he was sure his opponent would admit defeat. But as Henry's foot reached the third step from the bottom, he tripped and lost his balance. His head struck the stone floor and all went black. In a moment of insane anger, Jean-Claude raised his sword arm and ran the helpless man through. A little sanity, or at least the need for self-preservation, then began to return to Jean-Claude de Rochefort. He had committed murder, a deed for which he could be hanged. Before his crime was discovered, he must somehow get rid of the body. Henry was by no means a small man and would be too heavy to carry. Besides, Jean-Claude had only a short time to dispose of the evidence. What was he to do? He decided to dismember the body and throw the pieces into Lake Ontario. If they were found later, everyone would think that a soldier had been the victim of hostile Indians. He began his grisly work. Using his already bloodied sword, he first cut off the head and ran with it to the lake. Returning, he noticed the blood he had left on the floor and, finding some rags, mopped it up quickly. Ready to resume his horrible task, he heard the sound of voices from above and realized that the party was ending. The officers and girls would be coming down the stairs any moment. There was only one thing to do. With all his strength, Jean-Claude carried the body to the well and threw it in. From the depths of the well came a distant splash, and it was done. The partygoers stumbled back to their barracks in a much more drunken condition than the one in which they had arrived. If there were any who wondered about Henry and Jean-Claude, they probably thought both men had retired to their own quarters. Within the week, some of the officers noticed the absence of Henry and a search was organized, but it was fruitless. There were those, including Oneida, who were convinced that Henry had been murdered by Jean-Claude, but they lacked the evidence with which to step forward and accuse him. Oneida was certain that Henry was dead, for she knew he would have come back to her if he had been alive. For several months passed, and she did not have the heart to go to any parties at the castle. But one September night, when there was a party, she decided to go, for the purpose of listening and learning whatever she could that might give some clue to Henry's fate. The girls and officers left the village together, and some were surprised to see Oneida, for she had not been to the castle since the duel. That night she made it a point to mingle with as many of the officers as possible, but not to become deeply involved in conversation with any of them. Her objective was to find someone who was friends of Henry's and who had not been there that night that he disappeared. The evening passed, but she was not successful. Finally, she was preparing to leave with the other girls. A young man named Jacques came up and spoke to her admiringly. I know you. You were with Henry the night of the duel. I often admired you, but Henry was my dear friend, and I knew how much he cared about you. Your name was on his lips often. Thank you. Perhaps I shall see you again here at the castle. Jacques nodded, his 
face flushed with pleasure. Two weeks later, Jacques went to the Seneca village. It was on a night when the moon was huge and round with a cast to it, sometimes described as a blood on the moon. However often we see it, there is always something ominous about a full moon that is red. Jacques and Oneida sat talking with some of the other members of the tribe, and this time it was Oneida who brought the subject around to Henry. But Jacques stopped her. Oneida, it is not wise for us to say too much about it here. Let us go to the castle. The building was empty, for it was now almost midnight, and the men were in the barracks. They sat down on the bottom step of the same stairs where the duel had occurred, and Jacques began to tell her how he had lingered after the others had left on the night of the duel. I don't know what I expected. Perhaps the Henry would come back, but he did not. I sat right where we are right now. And what happened? I thought I heard a noise coming from the well. What did you do? I ran. That's what I did. Oneida looked at him accusingly. And later you began to think Jean-Claude might have killed him and put his body in the well, is that right? Yes, I thought of that, and also that he might not have been dead. Perhaps I could have saved his life. They both fell silent. It was almost midnight. Time to take Oneida back to the village, thought Jock. Hush. Do you hear something? Oneida whispered. Yes, like something scraping against stone. Do you know where it's coming from? My God, do you mean the well? Yes. The clock struck midnight, and then, as the pair watched, horror-stricken, fingers of a blood-stained hand crept very slowly over the side of the well. A second hand scrambled over the rim. Now the forearms of a man emerged, dressed in a soldier's uniform. The arms appeared to pull mightily, and as they did, the shoulders and upper portion of the man's body arose out of the well. Where the neck and head should have been, though, there was nothing at all, only a bloody stump. Jacques and Oneida fled, terrified. There was no doubt in their minds that Jean Glaude had murdered Henry and dropped this headless body into the well. Nor did Jacques keep what he had a secret. The well was explored, the body of the dead man was found, and Jean-Claude was hanged. But those who have been there when the full moon is high over the castle say, exactly at midnight, the ghost of the headless Frenchman begins to claw its way slowly, but surely, out of the well. After resting from its efforts, the ghost of Henry Leclerc rises, dripping moved slowly and awkwardly through the dark halls of the castle in search of its long-lost head. Old Fort Niagara is a state historic site opened by the Fort Niagara Association. Tours and events are conducted throughout the year. The End